Over the last few videos, we learned the basics of Docker and got a container up and running. What you'll find pretty quickly though, is that some of the things you normally do just won't work. Any graphical programs won't run at all. Things that communicate over a network can behave strangely. And as we saw at the end of the last video, any files you create on a shared volume will be locked. Today, we're gonna to step through and solve a bunch of these common problems with tweaks to both the Docker file and also the Docker run command. And again, I'll be showing it in the context of developing robotics and automation software, but most of it is gonna be relevant to many other Docker usage scenarios. What we'll have at the end of this video is a very solid platform on which you can build whatever crazy images you like. As a quick disclaimer, I'm sure some of the things I show in this video will be wrong, or at the very least, not the best practice. If this is the case, please leave a comment so that we all have an opportunity to learn. Also, full disclosure, a lot of the stuff I'm showcasing here, I've pulled straight from a set of Docker files created by Alison Thaxton. Alison has contributed a lot to the community and I'll include a link to her repo in the description. Finally, this video is sponsored by PCBWay. We'll hear more about them later in the video. So here's where we left off last time, but before we do anything else, we're gonna change which image we're working off. If you're not using ROS, you can ignore this bit, but basically there are two different repos that have ROS Docker images on them. Uh, they're meant to be used for different purposes and they're actually kind of based on the same source. It's quite confusing. Now in the last tutorial, I used ROS Humble, which is great, but it doesn't support GUI apps. And so rather than uh, going in and adding all of that sort of stuff ourselves, Instead, we're gonna change it to use OSRF slash Humble. And so that will give us access to a bunch of useful programs like RViz. If your container will only be used for command line stuff or you're short on space, you can stick with the old one and add things in as you need them. The first thing we'll get sorted out is the users. You might remember at the end of the last video that the file we created inside the Docker container was locked on the host because it was created by root. By default, all Docker containers run as root, and for some applications, that's totally fine and you can just move on. But often, we wanna run things as a regular user, either for practical or for security reasons. And especially, we often wanna do it as the same user, or at least a compatible one, as the host. To understand this stuff, you do need a bit of background on Linux user identification, and this is not my strong suit, but I'll do my best. In Linux, like most operating systems, there's the concept of a user. Each user has a username, but also a user ID number or UID. A lot of the time it's easier for the operating system to just deal with a number. And if it ever needs to translate between the number and the name, it has its own way of doing so. When a user creates a file, it stores the UID of the user that created it. When we type ls-l, we can see the usernames, but if we use ls-ln, we can see the user ID numbers, which is what it actually stores. On Linux, the root user is always zero, and on Debian systems like Ubuntu, the default user is 1000. If you're wondering what the second column is, there's a very similar concept called groups. Again, you have a group name and a group ID or GID. Groups are a way to give multiple users permission to access specific things. In previous videos, we've used the dialout group to access serial ports and the Docker group to run containers, both of which would otherwise require being root. There's also a group created for each user and that's called their primary group. So every file has both a user ID and a group ID associated with it. And this allows for things like only the owner of a file being able to edit it, but other users being able to view it. The important thing to realize here is that for a lot of system level stuff, the user name doesn't really matter. It's only looking at the UID and the GID. So we wanna tell Docker to use a new user and there are a few ways that we can tell it to do that, but none of them are gonna really work until we create the user for it to use. So here I'm gonna paste some code and you can see that this creates a new user with the username Ross and UID and GID 1000. These are set up as arguments, so you can change them at build time if you need to. Now you might be thinking that username is different to the host, which is currently DEC, but just wait and see, we can make it work. It also creates a home directory for the user and a config directory as some programs are gonna expect that directory to exist. So we can save that and then rebuild the container with docker build dash t my image. Whoops, I forgot that uh, the actual repo is humble 
desktop full. So now it's gonna have to pull down the new image. I'll just wait for that. Okay, so now that's built, uh, let's get back uh, into the other directory that we ran as a test last time. Now, last time, this was the command we used, and we can see we did docker run dash it, and then we mapped a particular volume into the image. Now what we wanna do is we wanna run it as our new user. So we're gonna add an extra argument in here that's dash dash user, and then we need to supply either the username or the UID, and then optionally the group name or GID after a colon. So we'll just specify the username as Ross. And so you can see now we're inside the container, but we've got this uh, Ross username here. And so if we CD into the directory, so I think it was my source code, here are those files we created last time. So now I'm gonna touch a newer file. And if I type ls-l, we can see here, a newer file is owned by Ross. But if I go into here, into the source directory on the host and ls-l, you can see it's owned by DEC. And that's because underneath both Ross and DEC are both user 1000. And so files created by one will be viewable by the other and so on. There might be some specific scenarios where you do want to make the username itself match the username on the host. Like if your code has hard-coded paths to files in someone's home directory or some other directory that uses the username. But for the most part, it should be fine. And if for some reason you need the username, the UID or the GID to be something different, you can either modify them in the Docker file or you can pass those in as an argument at build time. Sometimes you also want to use the new user inside the Docker file. This is pretty easy. We just type the user instruction and then the name of the user. So in this case, Ross. And then any other instructions that are issued after that will be issued as that user. This is useful if you want to create some files with certain permissions inside the Docker file and so on. And if you want to swap back to root, like if you then want to install something again, you just type user root. And then again, anything that you do after that is going to be run as root. It's also important to be aware that whatever the last user is set using a user instruction, that's gonna be the default user used when the container is run. Although you can always override that with the run argument as we just saw a minute ago. One little problem you'll find when doing this though, is if you end your Docker file on another user and then someone else goes to extend from your image to create their own one, they won't necessarily realize that any commands that they're executing are not being run as root. They could fix this easily enough by starting their Docker file with a user root, but if there's any chance that someone else will be building off your Docker file, it's good for you to end with user root and then just use the run command to select which user you want when you start the container. Another thing we might wanna do is add the ability to use sudo. Now this isn't really necessary. Uh, you can always use docker exec to create a new terminal in the container with root access, but it makes things a little bit easier. Now I've got one big run command, let's get rid of these that I'm gonna paste in here. And it's doing two main things. Firstly, it's installing sudo using apt. Uh, I did promise in the last video that I would explain what the go is with all this stuff and I'll get to that in just a minute. The other thing that it's doing is it's uh, setting up sudo privileges. So it's giving the um, user that's specified by username sudo permissions and it's also setting it up so that you don't need to enter your password every time you do sudo because uh, we haven't even set up a password. You can tweak these lines to change that behavior or to only allow certain programs to be run with sudo. Okay, before we move on, let's deal with these apt install commands. There are a few things to unpack here, so I'll have a go at answering some questions you might have. Why do we use apt get instead of just apt? You might be familiar with using the apt command, uh, and the apt command is designed to be user-friendly and not to be used in automated tasks and scripts like Docker files. On the other hand, apt-get is meant to be more reliable and compatible and used in scripts, even if it can be a little bit clunkier to use. Why do we need to run apt-get update before every single apt-get install command? Well, firstly, there's every chance that a previous call has completely invalidated the package list, in which case we need to refresh it so that we can install anything. More subtle though, is that when you're building and rebuilding Docker images, there's no guarantee that it will rerun old lines if it doesn't think it needs to. 
So if you're not updating the package list for every single uh, run call to app get install, then you could be working with a super old version from a previous layer uh, and end up with some incompatibilities and that sort of thing. Why do we have install-y whenever we do it? Well, otherwise it's gonna prompt the user for yes or no to install programs, but there's no one to type it in. So that forces it to answer yes to the questions. Another question you might have if you've seen other people's Docker files is why are they often splitting the apt commands over multiple lines with a backslash at the end of each line? Well, firstly, the backslash is what lets you split a command over multiple lines. And the reason you wanna do that is often we're putting our Docker files into a version control system. And if someone adds a new item, if it's all in one line, it's gonna say that that whole line has changed and you're not gonna know exactly what it was. Whereas by putting them on multiple lines, each new thing you add is just gonna register as a single line that gets added. It's also recommended that you order these things alphabetically, uh, just for ease of reading and maintenance. Now we could of course put every single individual program we wanna install on its own run command, but that would be annoying as we have to update the package list every single time. Why do we delete the package lists after we run the install command? Well, firstly, this saves on size in the final image because we don't want to bundle this extra information in our image unnecessarily, especially if it's happening on multiple different layers. It also prevents someone from forgetting to run apt get update before future install commands because if they haven't done that and you've done this, then they won't be able to install anything at all. According to the official documentation, for certain base images, it's actually not necessary to remove the package list manually. It's such a common thing that it will do it automatically, uh, but it doesn't hurt to do it yourself. Why do we put the apt get update, apt get install, and the remove commands all in one single run instruction? Similar to the previous points, splitting it up can cause issues with the Docker cache system, and it also can make your images bigger. Having it all in one command keeps that whole action of installing the program to a single instruction. One last thing you'll sometimes see is uh, it sets the environment variable Debian underscore front end equals non-interactive. Now this is another thing you're meant to do to ensure that you don't get other user prompts during the install process. Uh, in my testing, it didn't seem to make too much difference and from a bit of Googling, uh, even if you put it in there, it can still prompt you about certain things. But it's worth noting that it's recommended that you don't set this using a Docker env instruction. So that's the way you can set environment variables using Docker. Uh, that's because if you're not careful to turn it off again afterwards, then it will be off for any users that, that are gonna use it. So you're best off setting it inside the same line uh, with the run command. So now with those changes and sudo added, let's rebuild our image. And we can check that that works by rerunning our image. And if we go sudo nano, we've just created that file as root. The next thing, or to be honest, probably one of the first things that people often wanna get working in Docker is networking. If you're using ROS, you'll pretty quickly find out that things don't always talk nicely out of the box. This is by design with Docker. It actually has a highly configurable networking system that lets you do some pretty complex stuff. For generic robotic applications, we usually don't care about this and just want everything to talk like normal. Then you can add those complexities in later if you need to. To set this up, we'll actually take a break from the Docker file for a bit and change our run command instead. What we wanna do, what we wanna do is add uh, dash dash network equals host to tell it to just share the networking with the host. And in a similar vein, we wanna add dash dash IPC equals host so that it shares shared memory, which some comm systems will use. Now note that you'll sometimes see uh, the equal sign gets dropped and there's just network space host. Sometimes host is in quotes. It all does the same thing. So now when this is running, it should be sharing the uh, shared memory and the networking stuff with the host. So you can see now we get our host's uh, host name, which is deck, instead of before we had this random set of numbers. As with everything, the Docker documentation is very thorough on what options there are here, even if it is a little bit full on. Soon we'll take a look at how to get GUI programs to work, but that's gonna make our run command a whole lot more complicated. 
So before we do that, there's another important thing to look at. When we make our Docker file, we also get the option of specifying an entry point and a command. The way these two things interact is kind of complicated, but there's a particular pattern I want to demonstrate that's really handy, and it's actually the way that the ROS image is already working under the hood. We're going to create a bash script that sets up our runtime environment. Any scripts that we need to source, variables to set, that sort of thing. If you're using some complex DDS configuration, you might want to put that in here. This script will then act as an executable wrapper, and any arguments that are passed to it will be executed just as if you had typed them in directly, but with the extra context that we've provided. This script is our entry point. So here's an entry point script that I prepared earlier. It's in the same directory as the Docker file, and this script enables error signals, sources the ROS installation, prints whatever is passed to it, and then executes it. We can then go ahead and add some extra instructions to our Docker file. So we'll set the entry point, and we want to execute this script with bin slash bash. We also need to make sure we copy the entry point into there. So copy entry point to slash entry point. And then the next question is how do we pass commands into it? We can use the command instruction to specify an array of strings that will get passed in. We'll just put bash in there for now so that we have a working terminal. So we can save that and rebuild our image. And now when we run it, we should see that it prints out our provided argument was bash. What's really neat now is that if we supply extra arguments to this, so here is an argument, it's going to print out what we pass into it. Here is an argument, and then it's trying to execute this. And of course, the first line word here was the word here, and that's, that's not an executable. But what if instead I do, let's try ROS2 topic list. You'll see it's going to start the container, execute the command, and then quit. It's like I just ran the program on its own, and I'm completely oblivious to the fact that it's running on a completely different version of ROS and Linux underneath. I know there's been a lot to take in so far in this tutorial, and the next step where we're going to get graphical programs to work is even more complex. So we're going to take a minute to just pause, catch our breath, and check out the sponsor of this video, and that's PCBWay. As the name suggests, PCBWay is your one-stop shop for all your PCB needs. They've got single layer, multi-layer, flexible, rigid, every kind of PCB you can imagine. They can even assemble your PCB with all the components, saving you a lot of work. If you don't need a PCB right now, that's all right. They also do 3D printing, CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, injection molding, and more. So if you want to take the next step in turning your crazy maker ideas into a reality, you can head along to PCBWay by following the link down in the description. Next up is graphics. If this container is running headless somewhere, it doesn't really matter. But if we're using it for development, it can be helpful to be able to get in and take a look at things. Unfortunately, getting graphics to work properly in Docker can be a bit complicated. It can be dependent on the manufacturer of your GPU, the programs you want to run, and the kind of functionality you need. On top of this, there are just straight up a few different ways of achieving things that are more or less appropriate in different contexts. Also, I'm assuming you're using X Windows here. I have no idea if this works on Wayland or not. I've never tried. So what do we need to do? Firstly, we need to be running our container as a user that has permission to access X. If, like me, you're running your containers as a user that matches the host, that's great. It already has graphics access. If not, we need to add it. You can run xhost plus to give permission to all users, or xhost plus local to give permission to Oops, sorry, missed the colon there. X host plus local colon to give permission to all local users, or you can even specify a specific user. So X host plus local colon root, and that would give access to the root user, or you can swap that out for any other username. And so that will apply for this whole login session. So now any containers that I run as, as those users will have access. But I was running this container um, as a user that was equivalent to my user anyway, so I don't need to do that. You can also run those same commands with a minus to revoke those permissions. 
Secondly, we need to expose the X domain socket. As a test, I once tried not doing this and things still seem to work okay, but I'm sure it must be doing something important. So when we run our container, we want to add a new volume and we want to map slash temp slash dot X11 Unix. And we want to map it to the same place. So temp slash dot X11 Unix as read write. The third thing we need to do is give it an X display. And for that, we just set the display environment variable. We'll just tell Docker to use the same uh, one that the host is using rather than providing a specific value. So now if we start the container, oh, we still had our ROS2 topic list there. Now if we start the container and run RViz, hopefully, oh, let's open on my other monitor. Hopefully we should get some graphics. How good is that? We'll dig into this a little bit more in a future video on GPU acceleration in CUDA. But if you're having trouble with GUI apps and especially with 3D programs, you can try adding some of the things that I'll put up on the screen. Something worth mentioning briefly is the concept of locale and time zone. These are systems that let software know how it should represent certain pieces of data to the user. You might notice whenever you install a new Ubuntu system, it asks you for your time zone and language. For things to work properly inside our Docker container, we need to do the same. If you're using the official ROS Docker images, this has been handled for you and so you don't need to worry about it. But if you're creating your own image from scratch, just from the base Ubuntu image or something like that, I'll flash up some notes on the screen that you might find helpful. Another quick comment is on the topic of argument completion. This is where we can type ROS2 and then hit tab and it will suggest some possible things that we can do and if we type ra, it will complete to run. Normally we get the autocomplete for ROS when we source ROS and for Colcon there's also another script I'll show you in a second that you can source and it will autocomplete your Colcon commands. Unfortunately when we do this source inside our entry point here that autocomplete doesn't seem to pass down to the lower level so if I rerun the image if I type ROS2 and then hit tab, you can see it's just auto-completing the files. It doesn't know anything about ROS. I have to explicitly type source op ROS humble setup.bash. Oop, get rid of that ROS2 at the front there. And now when I type ROS2 and hit tab, it auto-completes to run. Now, I don't know uh, if there's a, a particular way to fix this, but a workaround is that we can add a bash RC file. So this is a, a standard thing that we often do where we often put these commands on the host um, and this will get executed by the terminal each time it starts up. So if we put the source command in there and I'll also get the Colcon one and then we'll make sure that we, as well as copying our entry point, we want to copy our bash RC and note that I'm copying this into slash home slash username slash dot bash rc. So we'll rebuild our image. And now when we run it, it should be executing that as part of the bash rc. And so if we type ROS to ra, it should auto complete to run or colcon bit and we get build. Similar to the entry point, you can also put other things here in the bash RC that'll get executed on the start of each terminal if you want to. Uh, if anyone knows a simpler way of getting the argument completion to work inside the container, please let us know. Also, if you're having other issues with autocomplete, make sure that Python 3-argcomplete is installed and you can also try installing bash completion. Finally, there are a ton of other tools, programs and libraries that are great to have in a base installation. You might want text editors or hex editors or compilers or linters. I've barely scratched the surface and the details are going to be different for everyone. But if there's something that you think is an absolute must have in any core development Docker image, please tell us all in the comments or even better, let us know in the corresponding discussion thread over at the Articulated Robotics Discourse Forum. Compared to where we were at by the end of the last video, our Docker container can do so much more now. We've got user accounts, graphics, networking, and more. This should get us through a lot of the hurdles that new users will come across.
One last thing that I did have in here but decided to put into the next video is how to pass through devices to Docker. This could be things like game pads, cameras, serial devices, and so on. But something you've probably noticed is that our run command has a lot of arguments to remember, and actually using things is still pretty clunky. So in the following videos after that, we're going to look at Docker Compose, which gives us a cleaner way to set all those runtime arguments, and VS Code Dev Containers, which makes developing on different platforms as simple as a few clicks. I haven't decided which order to do them in yet, so if there's one you particularly want to see first, please let me know. Thanks to those of you who are supporting the channel through Patreon. As always, if you want to join the community and see some more of this stuff, there's a link down in the description for that. And thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. Make sure you go over and check them out now. Alrighty, I'll see you next time.